Yes, yes, guess who got brands talking? Brandlive.co.za Hello and welcome to Creative Ghettos, the show that explores various creative industries and profiles the Africans who push them forward. Each week I spend 30 minutes unveiling excellent and inspiring individuals within creative industries, including but not limited to fine and contemporary art, architecture, design, food, film and literature. My name is Gwane Lukunene. Thank you for joining me right here on brandlife.co.za. Sibs Shangwe Lamere is my guest this week. Sibs is a South African filmmaker responsible for Necktie Youth, a film which saw him being thrust into the world's spotlight, winning awards all over the world, including the Durban International Film Festival. He also took home the Art Prize International at this year's Cannes Film Festival for his latest offering, Color of the Skull. I've been wanting to speak to Sibs for months now for two reasons. First, I just couldn't understand why no one around me knew who he was. Maybe I need to switch up who I'm hanging around with (laughs) and second you know after following his Facebook account it was promising to find someone who can be so real so human but also just so otherworldly this is our Skype conversation Seems. Cool. let's begin yeah. with your life's foundation, right? Uh, you grew up in Santon. Take us yeah. through what life was like from childhood right up to your teens. Well, I mean, childhood was 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 kind of all over the place. I mean, my my parents were very much the the, the part of that first class of uh, black um, intellectuals that were participating in in, in the global economy and trying to forge their own space and, you know, provide for their families in, 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 a, in a greater sense than was uh, accessible to black people before. So, I mean, with that came a lot of uh, moving, you know. I mean, my parents studied abroad. So when I was uh, born, like months later, I moved back to the U.S., uh, where my parents were at Wesleyan. And uh, after that, my dad became a Rhodes Scholar and went to Oxford. So, I mean, it was very much going wherever there was an opportunity or an opportunity to to lead to a bigger future until we came back to South Africa and settled. So, I mean, coming back to South Africa, I mean, it wasn't straight up Santon. You know, I think we our first house we got in was in Nordvik, you know, North like Vake, on the yeah, ed- yeah. <laughs> and the edge, you know, and yeah. uh, it was it was really through through we were first generation, you know, so it was like seeing my dad really hustle and hustle and break his back. And then by 12, you know, I was in Emerentia and I was at Emerentia Primary for a bit. And then eventually I went to Crawford, you know, where Santon was, was, I think, for a lot of South Africans or Africans as the richest square mile on the continent. It is this hub of opportunity, you know yeah. what I mean? The, the crown jewel of making it. Yeah. So it was, it was kind of like we felt, I think, uh, I was about 12 or so. Yeah. And I, I, I remember the sense in my family of like, wow, we're moving up, you know, we're moving into a new space. Mm. But that I think very much, you know, the realities of what South Africa is and what the politics of all this kind of stuff are, you know, was a very sheltered, very strange existence in a very white world, you know, where you're not really allowed to be who you are. And you there's a lot of the threat that you're not going to, you know, you're going to do the wrong thing or you're you're, you're not going to get the right grades and then you're not going to play with the right kids or go to the right university and your whole life's messed, you know, Mm. so the whole suburban pressure comes on, you know. So I found that Santon was, for me as an artist, it was the one place that was the least likely for me to be an artist. You know, I was going around a lot of sports and a lot of people who you, the thing was that you were going to go work with your dad and get a BCom and do that kind of life. And, and any very, other thing was not there. And that's very interesting that you, um, you know, that you highlight that because we're so inundated with sports, especially from a South right. African context, that thinking of, you know, pursuing something such as filmmaking or even becoming a photographer, that isn't your initial, it's not your initial pull in terms of uh, um, choosing a career. So how were you introduced to filmmaking? Wow, filmmaking, I think was like almost the last step. I mean, the first, (laughs) my first rock, my first love was was rock and roll music. And the whole pageantry behind that, because I remember being like about, nine years old and my parents made the dreadful mistake of getting me my own tv Mm. and i had dstv for the first time and my mom caveated with like okay but at night you're not allowed to watch mtv and this and that 
So of course that's what you watch at night. You know, the first thing you you're gonna watch is yeah. the things you're not allowed to. And I remember being about nine or ten. Oh no, I was like yeah, I was about eleven or so. And um, I remember just late at night crawling up to the TV and turning it on, and the room being flooded with an orange light and these kids on a bleacher. And this figure coming out that I would known to be Kurt Cobain, ah. and the whole sense of seeing that music video for "Smells Like Teen Spirit" was oh, the first man. time I think for yeah, myself man. as a disassociated suburban youth when you see all these kids that were outcasts. Where I was yeah. like, "Oh wow!" Like I didn't even know what it meant to feel outcast. I just felt different. Mm. And then that was the first calling card that there are people out there that don't fit in, and they have their own tribe. And that was really what called me to art, was more the sense of community, was more the sense of belonging, was more the sense of being in a space where people would like the things I like, hurt the way I like, and we could feel that same thing together. So I remember the first things were playing in bands and being like nine, like like 11 and making terrible demos like in my friend's house like persuading his brother to record us for like weed money and that was like the way we started making stuff and like self-distributing our records and it was that love affair of like being in a band and liking bands and collecting record covers and and that whole chase of music that made me feel very much part of it so it didn't it wasn't like a i felt like it was a natural progression you know because okay. that with that came skateboarding and that whole culture so it was very much more, which is how I feel still, you know, is that for me, my art practice is very much a part of who I am because it's a part of a cultural expression of angst or love or a lack thereof, as opposed to having walked into a gallery or being in an art school and being told art looks like this. Like yeah. for me, art was listening to a lot of, you know, rock music or whatever and racing down away from your house and having some sense of freedom and falling and scratching yourself and getting back up and knowing you've not made a class wow. and keep on going, you wow. know? And that for me was an ethos so of life, how to be punk. Life, that, life that is was art like, for you. Yeah. Life was art. Life is art. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's for me, I think, uh, the, the purest art, you know? And I think some people get to it through punk, you know? And with filmmakers, you know, you see Harmony Korine that's like, like skateboarding. It's actually a great quote about something and um, art. Harmony Corinne says, like, uh, it attracts a lot of creative people, skateboards, and a lot of heroin addicts, mm -hmm. and also a lot of creative heroin addicts. So, like, I think skateboard is a magnet for dissociated people, you know, to kind of find this, this, the way into art culture and street art culture. And for me, that was very much the root yeah. of, of, of art, which is not different from any other art, you know, that I look at now or I, I experience, you know, I feel it the same way, but maybe it comes from a different energy, but it's the same uh, vibe. Okay, so between school and your private life, um, how were you making sure that you were becoming a bit, a, a more refined writer? Because I, I suppose at that time you weren't really a director. Yeah. Uh, and I ask this question because, you know, no one gets to to your level of creating without a lot of practice, especially because you popped through when you were very young. I mean, they should have been, they must have been some sort of um, practicing that you were doing in terms of writing. Right. No, I mean, I feel my whole, my whole life was, was writing in that sense because either where it was trying to, to express something in, in music, you know, mm -hmm. so that was the first thing I remember being like, 13 and not even knowing what suicide was but me and my friend writing a song about suicide you know what I mean because yeah. it was like the theme that we knew from rock and roll music and we felt weird and that was a form of expression and a way to like kind of figure things out you know mm. so it was like um you know I feel like that was the genesis of writing was always a response in the beginning and then you know I actually had to find out about suicide and these tough things the, the hard way you know by providence mm. and then I remember like the day after the suicide of, of my girlfriend I started writing a, a piece just as a journal called um, my beloved country mm. um, and and uh, and and that started being something I was writing and writing and writing and then it became a journaling experience but I think like way I, I feel very lucky is that my writing was always for me, you know, in the beginning, it was always I wrote a lot through my teens, like extensively. And I never wrote it for, for friends. I didn't write it for the Internet. I didn't post it. It was what I did for myself. Mm. So it became a very natural way for me to actually be able to go through therapy 
And then, you know, through Necktie Youth was the first time I was like, I want to, through all these years, I've been making these journals on this big subject that I need to tackle for me as a human being to be able to move to the next phase of my life. You know, I need to liberate myself. And it was something I knew that I thought could happen. It wasn't about, oh, I'm going to be this filmmaker or anything. It was like, I think I need to tell the story yeah. really to mm -hmm. save myself. What I and like that's, okay, go that's on. the relationship I've always had with, with, my, with my work so far which I think is I'm, I'm blessed to have. Yeah. So what I liked a lot um, from Necktie Youth was your ability to really go deep into other people's perspectives. Um, what I had anticipated was that um, the main, the, the, the lead, the lead male, I thought that it was going to come from his um, perspective only. Right. Whereas, you know, everyone had an opportunity to whether the, the people were close to to emily or not um you know people had an opportunity to say what it is they felt about the situation that has transpired and what it means for them and their own personal lives um or what it doesn't mean you know in the in, right. the, in the bigger sense um how on earth were you able to tap into everyone's different perspectives so deeply because it's not it's really not surface level uh um you know it, it's it's i don't know for me i was just taken aback by that thank you um yeah i mean i don't know it's a tough question to answer i mean it's 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 very much i think necktie youth for me was 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 such a liberating experience you know as a filmmaker because i really didn't have this idea of, okay, I have to make it like with this protagonist that leads the film. I had this feeling of, I've grown up amongst these people and this is their story. You know, mm -hmm. it's not my movie. It's, it's, it's a portrait, you know, yeah. and, and more so than wanting a feature career or anything. It was more so like, how do I paint something that feels like, like that feels like Johannesburg for me, that feels like this lost space that I can show to these people who are part of this film, you know, and, and they could feel like they're represented, first of all, you know what I mean? There was, it, there was no real pressure outside of that, you know? So it was very much me, me just, I think it was, it was like a fever dream, you know, like kind of like a fever hallucination of almost mm -hmm. everything that had happened over the past five years, you know, and all these little moments of, of, of little tiny tragedies in, 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 in Johannesburg, you know what I mean, that I'd seen, or people at parties that, that at, at weekend after weekend where every time we go out, yeah. and by some point, at some kitchenist or some point, there's always that person who's taken it too far, and it's that darkness of being drunk, you know what I mean? And that's yeah. the, the, the sub of what is happening in their real lives, you know what I mean? What is the sub layer of the hurt? Mm. of the city you know what i mean and the hurt of being young and feeling forgotten and feeling lost and that was more the important thing to me to to, to portray than the story of one boy you know it was mm. the story of kids not being able to see each other and not being able to see the light in such a city with abundant beauty yeah. you know so that was really what i wanted to show and it was a sad portrait but it's a, a sad portrait of hopefulness you know because mm. i say it's it's a for me it was a, a project that was to be cruel to be kind you know it's like I, you don't want to show this you know we don't want to see this picture of the youth and especially of the kids i love but um i think with this wide kind of angle and and having this multi-perspective you kind of have something that shows like yes this is tough and we we the kids are not okay but if we don't learn how to love each other and see each other and two friends can't even speak honestly about the, the pain that they both know is very real, you know, then we are really lost. Yeah, yeah. It's because then we have communication and we're, 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 we're outside of ourselves, which is what I kind of, it really, really is what I feel about not so much Johannesburg youth, but everywhere with this social media and all this craziness, you know, you get, you can get lost in it and not be a person anymore and it gets scary. Yeah, yeah. And the trick of, of, you know, uh, uh, trying to not get consumed by the excess of information and, exactly. and all sorts of things. Yeah. So in your TED Talk, because I, uh, I watched Ooh. your TED Talk. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, it's like every time I, I look at that, it's like I always say to friends, it's like when you're 18 yeah. and you think you're really, really damn smart, you know, and it's like I just have that on a video. Were you 18 stage. when that happened? <laughs> I was 19. You were 19. I, I mean, it was really good. It was it was really really you know, good. No, I look at it and outside 
outside of being 19, you know, it's like it's the ethos of what I believe still of like my my ultimate message in my art is like the tragedy of the world, yeah. but that we are so beautiful, you know, is that we are so beautiful, but so lost. Yeah. So I think it has that in it, but gosh. Do, do you know what? Actually, before, <laughs> we even, b- before we even speak about the TED Talk, there's something else that I wanted to ask you, and it has to right. do with, you know, in the process of you making a movie or making music, whatever it is, that you want to put out to the public. Do you, do you always feel like you're on top of your game? Uh, um, <laughs> And, and that what the public is going to receive is going to leave them, you know, more than satisfied. Or do you sometimes feel like, oh, God, you just hope for the best. You're just like crossing your fingers. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think I'm lucky in the sense that it's not it's not about that for me. Yeah. You know what I mean? It really isn't. Okay. And it's not about chasing that for me, because I, I, I think that. You know, there's so much noise. You know, Mm -hmm. we live in a world of so much people trying, you know what I mean? And pushing their agenda of like, look at me, follow me, this, 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 this. Um, You know what I mean? What do they want? What do they want? Mm -hmm. That my attitude is always like, you know, the art and the books that mean a lot to me are the things that have been so truthful about life or such an honest portrait that I see myself in it. Mm -hmm. And I've always, when I was growing up, I was like, how do people do that? I mean, how do you do that? And I thought like, Okay, if I think of a really good story, like a really rich story, and I write really good, but it's like, yeah, I could do that, and then, but then I'm I'm always chasing what they, someone else's approval, yeah. or someone else's vision. But you know, I've been lucky so far. Like Necktie Youth was a huge tragedy, and then something, you know, I lost myself in a big way after that through the the, the Hollywoodness of everything and the flying, and crumbled and found love, like in Sao Paulo and that meaning, and then wow. decided to write again, you know. So for me, it always becomes like, I've gone through a lot and I need to say this to you. And I need to say it however I'm going to say it. Like now I want to make some music because I'm not shooting, you know, mm. and that's what it's going to be. And uh, my attitude is very much like, hey, there's so much stuff out there. Take it or leave it, man. Like take it or leave it. If you don't dig it, that's cool. You know, there's so much other stuff. Yeah. But if it means something to you, dope, like really dope. And I'm here to talk about it. Like, and I'm here for that. Okay. And I feel that that is, for me, like that was my attitude with Necktie and traveling the world with that film. The response that mattered to me was people saying, dude, I know you're from South Africa, but this could be New York and my friends are like this. Or this is Sydney and this is something I'm scared of. Or, mm-hmm. um, you know, this is Australia, this is, you know, uh, Sweden and the same issues. And then I realized like, oh, okay. For me, real art, like real, real prophecy is like where you... When you say something so human and you allow yourself to be naked, truly be you and say what's really there, you actually realize you're not that special Mm. because everyone feels those things. But then everyone applauds because people say, God damn, that's what I'm even scared to say about myself. Mm. So my my task every day is that's why I always like, you know, even if it's just posting or, or saying something, it's like I'm not seeking to reach many people, but I'm seeking to say something real. You know, so my whole thing is to be like, just be real because those it's going to hit someone if you're vulnerable. And if you say stuff that you're afraid to say, and then that's going to empower other people to feel like themselves. And there's an art to that. You know, the, the one thing that is uh, interesting for me is how when when I'm researching you and reading about things that you've done, uh, a lot of the time, you know, people write about how you you telling things from a South African perspective and when you engage with the work, it's so human because I didn't grow up in Santon, for instance, but, but I, I mean, I get it. I get what you're saying. And, 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 and also I get what you're saying, not even just from a teen perspective, I get it as an adult. So, so I wish that we would also just start, you know, writing from that, you know, when we, when we're describing things, make it more, universal because we're all on this earth and somehow you know we're, we're but this all... is always the thing it's like i always feel that this is where you're, you're 100 percent right but it's how do we go about that you know and for, for me i always try to say to artists it's like the anxiety of being an artist is almost so stressful that you don't make it art you know because you can be so in your own like okay well is it is it is it hitting is it is it universal enough is it representing these people enough you know what i mean where you i think when it becomes super universal mm. is when it becomes so simplistically true. And the simple truths are, are, are honestly the most striking. And, you know, for me, it's like when I write, like, or I think of something, I think of the base route, you know, like I'll say, like with Sound of Animals, 
what have I learned? You know, like what is my what is my main thing? And I want to talk about, you know, how dark the world is and how we can always search for the grass being greener on the other side. And then, um, you know, but at the end of the day, we always run into ourselves. And the only thing that will get us through is real faith and love. And I'll say that that's what I want to say. And once I decide that, I'll decide about the apparatus in which to say it. Then I'll think of a story that makes sense to be a metaphor for the construct. You know what I mean? Because then it's based in truth. You know, then it's, it's totally real. And then I know that everyone has to be real then the characters become so real to me. That's not about my movie. It's about being real to this person's experience that I'm writing about and painting them in a way that's real. And I think that that comes, comes out as, as being a lot more organic. I like to think for Mm -hmm. myself or, or films I like, you know, I generally at the end of the day, as someone who watches films, you know, I, you know, you you can see a film that's $20 million or shot on an iPhone, but if it's from an eye of, of someone who's trying to tell you, what they see in a world from their perspective, it's always it's always entertaining yeah. enough for me, you know. Yeah, it's always next level. Okay, so you're you're, you're currently working on two films, right? Uh, the first being Color of the Skull, and yes. the second, The Sound three. of Animals. Fight. Oh, is it three? Yes. I mean, Meridian. damn. Meridian. Oh, okay. Because that wasn't confirmed. I thought. I didn't think that was confirmed, so I don't want to. No, that's that's busy. That's busy in in, in casting. So that's oh. been announced at, at Con. Well, but so so yeah. it's like this is the thing. I need to caveat that by saying like that always sounds like a lot, you know, okay. because people are like, well, what do you mean doing three films? But it's like, you know, in the indie <laughs> film, like I don't do commercials. I don't do anything but movie writing. You know, I so I to actually keep keep everything going. You write three scripts, you know, and I keep them, and they don't go at the same time. You know, one will be. Like Sound of Animals is ready to go now where something else is really at the beginning stages of financing, you know. Mm. So over the past three years, like I took a three year like sabbatical to like really sort myself out and to really put out my best work. And through those years at different times, these scripts got to the to the to the point that the producers and us on the projects felt like, OK, we're ready to go. Yeah. So we just at a stage now where things like con. We just, with Color of the Skull, we just financing that. We've just started that, and the con thing was incredible. Yeah. But it's, it's Congratulations for that. Oh, that was crazy. That was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> because but, you, yes, you're officially so on the can uh, winner's roll, you know? Dude, that's nuts. I Emma. know. It's Faz points. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. That, no, it's, it's, it, was, it was wild, you know? For me, it's just like, these things for me at this point in my life, you know, I think I've been, I'm, I'm like, it, it gets a bit, it's, it's overwhelming, mm. but it's, it's really more, more so than it's about my career. I've, I've started to really see what it means about like being a black kid who talks about gang rap and talks like this, you know what I mean? Mm. Living in Europe and stuff like that. It's like, it's you, 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 you really, you really see how, you know, the image of the black man in the world is so like suppressed. You know what I mean? If it's mm. not the black man who's acclimatized to the white agent, like way, you know what I mean? And yeah. speaks that way. But as soon as you start speaking, like you're a rap guy, like even where I go now, even with big rooms now, people will make fun of like, yo, bro, yo, yeah, until yeah. you go and you write and you do your thing. And then for me, that's just a bigger proof of like, be you yeah. because being you is always, is always the champion thing. You know, it's always the right thing to do. No matter what people are saying, it's always the scariest and it's likely to be the most challenging. Seems, but it's always probably the more rewarding because at the end, you, you, you. Seems, I just want to ask you two quick questions. And, yeah. and the one can be a bit extensive. Um, okay. The last one will be very quick. Um, you know, you talked about taking a three-year sabbatical of sorts mm. where you were still yeah. working in, in some way. Right. What, you know, during that time, how are you sustaining your life? Because, you know, that's a difficulty a oh, lot of people geez. go through well, I mean, so what, that they're what, not what? writing commercials and things like that. Oh man, I mean, it was it was it was tough. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie. It was dark times. I mean, necktie necktie youth um, kept me afloat for a little bit, very little bit. <laughs> and then we were we were lucky with the with with the film festival run because what a lot of people don't realize like you're winning like a European festival and you'll get like nine thousand euro, you know, mm. and that converts to a hundred hundred and twenty thousand rand. Mm. So these festivals are negligible, you know, so it was I was literally like at points where you're in a foreign country, like at a, at a premiere of your movie with no money, 
real money in your bank account、yeah. looking and praying to god that you win yeah <laughs> and just being like yes oh fuck yes and people are like dude this is like a small like local <laughs> festival like why are you so jazzed about this weren't you at berlin male it's like dude yeah i just checked out what swiss francs converts to bra and、yeah. like i owe people money <laughs> so i mean there was a lot of that but there was also like uh you know it was it was pretty much like What what happens is like with the with the U.S. system, what's really cool is that the the financing is a lot better, you know. So for a treatment, you can get a lot more cash, you know. So I'd write things or start developing like series stuff in the U.S. and get commissioned to do stuff that as just a writer, you know? yeah. You know, and then you just live in being when we're living in、uh, L.A. eating like one. One、uh, one cent one one dollar burritos a day,、wow. yeah. Eating one dollar burritos and packets of ninety cent hash browns. One time, real real talk. One time we went to a local supermarket to buy a packet of chips, and Shuan gave the credit card, and it declined on one dollar. And the girl behind the counter looked at us like, "Y'all niggas serious? Are you, <laughs> are you, you guys are seriously using a credit?" To pay for one, one dollar, dollar, and you don't have a dollar, dog. <laughs> It's dark for you,、yeah. dogs here.、Yeah. And I remember that's when we walked out, and we we're like, "Dude, it's over. Like, all we can do is go further." You know, and、yeah. that's really, I mean, kudos to like having people. I've only really survived that, but also having people like Shuan, people who like believe in you and keep you going, and people who are like, when you're like, "Dude, I need, I can't pay rent." People are like, "Dude, are you riding?" Okay, I'll pay your rent. Like we're a team, you know,、wow. and that's how I survived it. I did、wow. it by the grace of God and and mercies. Wow, Steve. Okay, I was gonna ask you the last <laughs> question, but unfortunately, I am completely out of that time. That is a lot of questions.、Yeah. Um, <laughs> listen, I wanted to speak to you more about Drake, but we'll have to. Oh, we'll have stop! To move- <laughs> we're gonna rap about that.、Eh? <laughs> we're gonna have to move that to another time. Get me in my、uh, feelings now with this album. <laughs> Jeez, Louise. The new album. I know. Of okay, okay, okay. Let okay. me wrap up. It, seems, <laughs> it was such a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so I hope you enjoy your stay here in South Africa. Oh man, I really didn't want that to end. There was just so much we could have discussed. I, I guess we're just going to have to connect via watching his films. If you haven't seen Necktie Youth, get it, see it, and more importantly, get prepared for Lemaire's upcoming films: Color of the Skull, The Sound of Animals Fighting, and Meridian. Otherwise, you can follow him on Instagram at Sibs Shangwe Lemaire. To find out more about the Africans who drive various creative industries forward, make sure to follow Creative Ghettos on Instagram at Creative Ghettos. My name is Guanelo Lugunene. Join me again next week Friday from two to two thirty p.m. for another impactful show. Bye for now. You're listening to BrandLive.co.za.